This episode is brought to you by AudioQuest, makers of the mythical series Analog Interconnects. Click the link in the show notes for more information. I want to ask a question today, and it's an important question. And it's a question that affects everybody who is running a pair of loudspeakers in a room. And that question is, can room correction software improve or correct the sound of those loudspeakers in the room. Basically, can room correction software improve the sound of the room? Welcome back everybody to Reverb Hell. This is probably episode three by now. Today we're not in my new listening room in Lisbon, we're upstairs in my office. This room has very similar dimensions to my lounge room downstairs. It's seven meters by four meters. It has a tiled floor, there are lots of bare walls. The one key difference here is the pitched ceiling, which slopes gently backwards towards the rear of the room and I think it goes all the way down to something like 0.7 meters. And yes, I have bashed my head at least four times already putting the boxes back there. Now you can hear on my microphone that this room has a significant, a significant reverberation or reverb problem. And that's basically where the sound is coming out of my mouth and it is hitting walls and the ceiling and the floor and bouncing around the room until it arrives at the microphone here and it mixes with the direct sound from my voice to create this kind of melange of reflected sound and direct sound. And we can measure that, we can measure the reverb in this room and I've done that with the Umic One microphone placed at the listening position and using the loudspeakers on my desk which are a pair of Genelec G2. And I've measured the frequency response and the RT60. The RT60 is basically it tells us how long each frequency takes to decay by 60 dB in the room at the listening position. And if we look at the RT60, we can see that it's not quite as bad measurement wise as the room downstairs. And that's probably the ceiling that's causing that. Basically it starts at, I've got the graph here on my tablet. It starts at about 0.8 seconds, goes down quickly to 0.7 and then slowly descends to 0.6. Now 0.6 seconds is just about inside the range that we're trying to target for reverb because acoustic professionals tell us that we should have a reverb time somewhere between 0.3 seconds and 0.7 seconds, although some say 0.6 seconds is the upper limit. So we're kind of hitting the upper limit from above with this room here, but you can hear that it sounds absolutely shocking, right? It sounds appalling, although my brain is processing it differently to yours because you're hearing it through the microphone and I'm hearing it here for real and my brain will filter out some of the reverb to make it not sound too bad. And that means in your room where you're listening to music at home, your brain might also be filtering out some of the reverb that you have. And if you've lived in your home for a significant amount of time, you might have become accustomed to the reverb. So one way to hear that anew is basically just do the clap test and just clap your hands and listen for the ring. An even better way is to take a phone and basically make a video recording or an audio recording by putting the phone on top of a loudspeaker and then you sit on your couch and then you make a prayer to the room reflection gods. Basically to pray that your bare walls and ceiling and floor are not adding to the reverb, which of course they are. But once you've made that mobile phone recording, listen to it through a pair of headphones and you will hear your room reverb unfiltered by your own brain, which is essentially what you're hearing in my room here today. Now downstairs in my lounge room, in my listening room, 
The RT60, the reverb time, is even worse than it is in here. It is at least a second. I think a couple of points, it's 1.1 second. And in the last video, we saw that sofas and rugs don't really do very much to improve that reverb time. So what I wanted to do was then investigate, could room correction software do something about the reverb time? Now there is room correction software built into the Bookart A500 that I have in my listening room downstairs. Well, actually it's built into the Platin Hub that feeds the loudspeakers over WISA wirelessly. And what we do is we take an iPhone and we activate the Bookart smartphone app and we push begin and that allows the hub to generate, I think it's white noise, but it could be pink noise. And while that white noise or pink noise is playing for like 90 seconds, we have to wave the phone around the room and the microphone is read by the smartphone app. And what it does as we are moving the phone around the room and getting into the corners and near the walls, it models the acoustic behavior of the room and then suggests a correction curve for the loudspeakers in that room. And I did exactly that with the Bookart A500. In fact, I did it several times because I wasn't getting a proper reading. And I actually sent the graph off to Mads Bookart and he's like, yeah, that's wrong. There's something wrong. And it turns out I have a faulty Platin Hub. But as we will see, that faulty Platin Hub doesn't really, it's not really material to the results of this video. Because what I did is I took a Room EQ Wizard measurement again at the listening position with the room correction software on, then I turned it off, took another measurement, and then on the screen right now, you're seeing the results, the RT60 results of having the room correction off and on. So room correction off is in green, room correction on is in orange. And you can see that even with the room correction on engaged on the Bookart A500, it makes no difference to the reverb time between 300 hertz and four kilohertz. 300 hertz and four kilohertz is important because that's the mid-range and the treble. That's where voices are heard. So yeah, we can say that the book art room correction software does nothing for our reverb time, which kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because once the sound is out of a loudspeaker, the loudspeaker no longer has control over it. Neither does the amplifier or the streaming front end or the room correction smarts. The sound is out of the loudspeaker and it's bouncing around the room. But we can also look at the frequency response of the room correction software from the Bookart loudspeakers. And you can see from the graph that there is a difference there. You can see that the room correction is pushing more low end into the room. But you can see the point where it stops making any difference and that's at 350 hertz which is why my faulty readings don't really matter because it's quite clear from the frequency response and I had this confirmed by Bookart that the room correction software inside the Platin Hub stops at 350 hertz. And we wanna deal with 300 to 4K. So the room correction software inside the Bookart loudspeakers slash Platin Hub does nothing for us and our reverb time in the all important mid range and treble region. So essentially the room correction software that comes inside the Platin Hub only tackles bass. And that's important because if you're listening in a small room like this one, four meters by seven meters. You might think it's large, but I think acoustic professionals would call this a small room. Bass can be a problem, although it really isn't for me downstairs, but the whys and wherefores of that are beyond the scope of this video because we're concentrating on reverb time between 300 hertz and four kilohertz. And we need to look at a different room correction software that does actually tackle that region. And that software is Dirac Live, which is built into the NAD M10 V2 that I have driving a pair of Zoo Soul 6 loudspeakers. Now, out of the box, we only get the LE version. And the LE version of Dirac Live is curtained at 500 hertz. So it gives us a little bit more, but not enough to go all the way to four kilohertz. To lift that restriction, we have to pay a $99 upgrade fee. I did that a long time ago. That $99 fee also allows us to edit the correction curve. But what I did next was I phoned my Dirac Live professional installer friend, Terry Ellis in London, and got him to remote desktop into my MacBook to make sure essentially that I didn't make any mistakes with measuring the room, using my microphone and Dirac Live. And we actually measure five points. So around the seat, around the listening position. So we did that, Dirac Live then analyzed the room, gave us what it thought the frequency response was of the loudspeakers at the listening position and suggested a correction curve for those loudspeakers. Now we chose not to edit the correction curve. 
we wanted to see what Dirac Live sort of did in its default state with no intervention from a professional. That's Terry Ellis, not me. Now, before we get to the measurements, I want to just make a comment on what I heard from the loudspeakers with Dirac Live on. And that is something that I've heard many times before, and that's an improvement to the image specificity of the phantom center that gets drawn by the loudspeakers between the loudspeakers, right? So like drummer over here, and maybe saxophone player over here, and then bassist right in the middle. So Dirac Live definitely makes some audible improvements, even in my crappy reverberant room downstairs. But if we look at the measurements, and we'll look at the frequency response first, you can see Dirac on is in orange, Dirac off is in blue. You can see that Dirac Live is making changes all the way up and down the audible band. So from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And you can see that it's brought the mid-range bump down a little bit. It's pushed a little bit more into the low end. So essentially we have a smoother frequency response from the zoos at the listening position with Dirac Live on. And that might be one reason why I'm hearing better image specificity from the zoos with Dirac Live. However, if we move over to the RT60 curve, it's a familiar tale that we've seen many times before. No meaningful change to the RT60 with Dirac on. Again, it's in orange, off is in blue. In fact, looking at this graph, you could make the case that Dirac has made the reverb time between 300 hertz and let's say 600 hertz has made it worse, just slightly worse. And that might be because Dirac has chosen to push more energy into the room at those frequencies. But essentially, I would call that no meaningful change whatsoever. And again, it makes sense, doesn't it? Because once the sound leaves the loudspeaker, Dirac Live no longer has control over it bouncing off a wall, then off the ceiling, then off the floor, then off another wall before it arrives at the listening position. And it will do that millions of times all around the room, in my case, for a full second. So the reverb time with Dirac Live on is still roughly one second in my listening room downstairs. Now, if you're wondering, what about Room Perfect, John, and the Lingdorf TDAI 1120? I'm sorry, I didn't bring it with me to Lisbon, but we have looked at two different room correction systems today. And I asked the question at the start, can those room correction software systems improve the sound of a room? Well, I think the answer is yes, but also no. So in the frequency domain, it's very clear to me from the measurements I've taken with Room EQ Wizard that the room correction software from Booker and from Dirac Live inside the NAD are making meaningful changes to the frequency response. But they're making no meaningful changes to the RT60 between 300 hertz and four kilohertz. And it might be that Dirac Live and the Booker system can make some time domain changes, but they're not showing up in the graphs that I've taken using Room EQ Wizard and my Umic One microphone. So essentially, if you have a reverb problem in your room, if you've done the hand clap test, or you've recorded yourself talking to your phone from the listening position, or you've actually used Room EQ Wizard and a microphone to measure the RT60 in your room, if you've done that and discovered that your RT60 really goes above 0.7 seconds, then you have a problem. And having watched this video, now you know that room correction software cannot fix your reverb problem in your listening room. It definitely can't fix it in mine, not downstairs, not here. So we've seen now that a rug and a couch cannot make any meaningful change to the RT60 in a room. We've seen that room correction software cannot make any meaningful change to the RT60 in a room. So really all that's left to do, all that we really can do, is put up physical treatments. And we'll tackle that in the next video. But if you like this video, if you found it informative or entertaining or a bit of both, then please consider giving it a like down below. If you like my attitude, not to hi-fi in this case, but to the listening room, because the listening room is the number one factor in essentially what you'll hear from your loudspeakers when listening to music. The listening room's physical makeup matters more than your amplifier, your DAC, your phono stage, your turntable, your streamer, room correction software. It is the number one factor contributing to what you hear from your speakers in your room. If you dig that, then please consider subscribing to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. You could hear it ring, couldn't you?